of our today's conference, Diplomacy, your questions, our answers. I welcome you to a special presentation of the Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution. I welcome here as our uh, main speakers and experts, Mr. Moritz Ehrmann, director of the ASPR, and uh, Mr. Jan Pospisil, research director of uh, this institute. Well, as you can see from the background photo of uh, Mr. Ehrmann, um, the center is located in a beautiful old castle, castle in uh, the southern area of Austria in Burgenland, very close to the Hungarian border, beautiful area. And great work has been done over the last four decades. The ASPR was uh, founded in 1982 and through its very valuable work uh, has earned uh, the title of a peace messenger. And it was also awarded uh, a UNESCO prize for peace education. Um, I would like to introduce um, the director of this institute to you, Mr. Moritz Ehrmann. Um, he started off as a career diplomat in the Austrian Diplomatic Service and worked in the Austrian OECE Chairmanship Task Force from 2016 to, uh, to 2017. Since 2018, he has been engaged in informal international peace mediation and has acquired vast experiences in this field. He worked inter alia in Iraq, Colombia, Jordan, Ukraine and Yemen and also with the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, Mr. Jan Pospisil is uh, the research director of the ASPR. He is um, a wonderful lecturer. He uh, also works uh, for the University of Vienna. He has been a lecturer at the Diplomatische Akademie Wien. He is a co-investigator of the political settlements research program at the University of Edinburgh. He is a great expert on peace processes, political settlements, humanitarian negotiations, resilience, and the Sudan. And he also publishes uh, on a regular basis. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to quote um, Joseph Joubert, a French essayist, um, at the beginning of our presentations and uh, discussions. And Joseph Joubert once stated that you should never cut what you can untie. And I think uh, this phrase summarizes very well the work done by the ASPR, never cut what you can untie. If you have a super entangled, complicated situation, you have to study this situation, analyze it, do some research, train the right experts, uh, give them the correct skills, and then try to mediate and uh, untie the situation without using uh, sharp objects, be it uh, scissors in this situation of Joubert or uh, arms. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to inform you that you can ask questions to our experts online. If you follow us on Facebook, uh, just let us know what your questions are. And after the presentations, um, Mr. Pospisil and Mr. Ehrmann will answer them. We will have about one hour for this event. And I now give the floor to Moritz Ehrmann. Please, Moritz, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Susanne, and thank you very much uh, for, for this uh, very kind uh, and very comprehensive uh, introduction uh, to our work. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, chose the title of this, um, mm, of this session that we're having here with uh, some thought uh, behind. Um, and uh, so, of course, the question is very relevant. What does it mean to be inside uh, conflict? What do perspectives have to do with all of this? Um, and um, perspectives um, are probably one of the things that matter most when it comes to uh, conflict, because conflict, in essence, is subjective. So this means that Mm. in a conflict, uh, whoever is part of the conflict, each side 
could be subjectively speaking right. Um, however, the perspective uh, that you find yourself in might be that everyone else uh, in, in the conflict is your, is your enemy um, and that you are uh, the victim and the other one is the perpetrator. Um, so the question is, of course, how to react to such a dynamic, as it often comes about in any conflict situation. Um, and uh, the answer is, of, or one of the answers is, of course, that you need to talk to victims and perpetrators alike. And the funny thing is, of course, that in most cases, uh, all of the sides are a little bit of both at the same time. However, they themselves uh, would uh, define themselves. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the next step, to try to induce them uh, to step out of these roles that they have uh, created for themselves and that they have created for uh, the other side. So kind of uh, to get them to leave uh, their uh, zo zone of comfort, so kind of this artificial uh, certainty so that uh, uh, I'm the good one, the other one is the bad one, uh, this is us uh, and, and, and this is the other one and the other one is uh, the enemy. This is perhaps my zone of comfort in this, uh, uh, this provides some certainty uh, for me in this huge uncertainty that uh, a conflict situation generally uh, entails. Um, and then once this step is taken, um, this is when you can start to uh, untangle uh, or untie uh, the knot, as, uh, as you put it very well, uh, Susanne. Uh, this is when the zero-sum logic uh, can end. Uh, it's when the realization uh, comes that there is perhaps more than the only one solution that I have uh, uh, imagined Myself, myself uh, uh, to be. Um, this is one perspective. So how how do how do uh, uh, how does somebody see this from from the from the very inside of the of the conflict dynamic? Um, inside of the conflict dynamic are uh, 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 paradoxically speaking, of course, also external actors such as. Um, such as ourselves, who, who uh, in our work with the uh, Austrian Study Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, we try to uh, approach uh, this knot and uh, uh, and, find, and 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 try different ways to to untie it. Mm. And um, there is indeed sort of value to uh, stress this point that there is different uh, approaches necessary and different uh, ways necessary to, to do this. And this is uh, something that has been uh, very much alive in the tradition of the, of the ASPR, um, in a sense that on the one hand, uh, for the last uh, 30, 40 years, um, conflict parties from all over the world um, have come to uh, our castle in, in Stadtschleining, um, and uh, the, the Institute has, has uh, uh, assisted them with uh, facilitation uh, of, of their conversations. Um, also, at the same time, we, uh, we travel ourselves to, to, to different conflict regions uh, uh, to try to do the same. Uh, currently, uh, this might be Libya, Iraq, uh, Sudan, uh, Israel, Palestine, or other places. Um, but um, this is not where our work uh, ends. Uh, also, um, we each year we bring hundreds um, of uh, professionals. So whenever there isn't a corona pandemic, of course, um, we bring hundreds of uh, professionals working themselves uh, in conflict areas. So as part of uh, different uh, uh, missions of international organizations, uh, or be it the, the OSCE, the European Union, um, from volunteers to highly specialized uh, civilian and, and, and military staff. All these people come to, uh, to be trained um, 
in 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 uh, in our castle in in, in Schleining, um, in all sorts of issues that that uh, you can imagine relate uh, to the issue of conflict in a, in a wider sense. Um, we also, in this case, uh, take the training to, to some of these places ourselves. So we also have a training program that takes place uh, in uh, several uh, Western uh, African countries, such as uh, Mali, Nigeria, um, but also in places like uh, other places like Somalia or uh, Iraq. Um, this is again not where it ends, um, because uh, 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 of course, I should have perhaps mentioned this first, our, uh, our research director also being part of the conversation, but um, um, our research, uh, especially on, on, on peace processes um, that we are currently uh, conducting, um, does not only feed into uh, publications and conferences, which is, of course, something uh, very valuable and, uh, uh, and necessary, um, but um, it is also um, the basis for many of our practical uh, and direct um, work with conflict parties. Um, my colleague Jan will, will speak uh, more about this, but uh, I'll also give you an example before, before he goes into uh, more detail on, on, on sort of where his uh, uh, very specific uh, research in, 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 in one uh, or two cases um, has uh, in the end uh, led him. Um, but let me also give you an example so that I also uh, uh, practically explain a bit more what, uh, what, what this means. Um, so it means, for example, that when uh, recently we, we conceived a new project uh, in Libya, um, where in essence we facilitate dialogue between different uh, stakeholders from the south of Libya and the, the capital uh, Tripolis um, on uh, conflicts uh, relating around uh, the water structure, uh, the water infrastructure in, in, in Libya. Um, and so on the one hand, logically speaking, we employ our own expertise uh, in dialogue facilitation uh, and mediation when organizing this. At the same time, um, we are also um, in parallel uh, conducting uh, a study on the results uh, of these dialogue meetings um, from technical uh, uh, and, and socio-political uh, perspectives. Um, to uh, provide clearly um, formulated uh, outcomes and, and recommendations um, to be passed uh, to other relevant uh, stakeholders that are not directly uh, part of the, of the dialogue activities. Um, and in addition to this, um, we, we will also train um, several of the uh, Libyan uh, dialogue participants uh, in mediation and conflict transformation um, in order to increase the sustainability uh, and ownership of the project. So this is, in short, one very concrete uh, example of, uh, of how we try to um, sort of live um, in practice uh, this multifaceted uh, uh, approach that the Institute uh, uh, entails. Um, but yeah, as promised, uh, uh, my colleague Jan uh, Pospisil, uh, I assume, will now talk uh, more about uh, his very direct, uh, uh, one or two very direct cases of, of his experience uh, in this regard. Um, thanks so much. It's a bit, um, for more said, it's often a, a, a combination between accidents and smart decisions that take one into what Morris calls inside conflict. Um, because the, I mean, my, my own kind of, of, of career in the last like 10 years is, is a bit of, 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 of showing how these things work because I had like the luck to join um, the political settlements research program in the UK basically from its inception 2015. And it's one of these big um, um, projects funded by the British government at this time. Uh, the Department for International Development, meanwhile, um, the British Foreign Ministry. And this gives you the chance, um, and these chances are rare actually, to, to conduct research that is academically 
viable and basically state of the art and, 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 and has at least the, the ambition to be world leading, but also it forces you to combine this work with, with practical impact because basically the funders, and here the, the, the interesting element of funding comes in, the funders um, demand this from you. And I think this is, this is important to have in mind when, when thinking about funding specifically for the work we are doing at the ASPR, it's not just about having funding for kind of doing, doing things, but funding is also like the entry point into, into what practical relevance means. Because if somebody's giving you sometimes a lot of money, um, they usually want to see something for this money out of it. And this, this helps in a way facilitate practical impact. So what we did in, in, in Edinburgh, and I was working in Edinburgh for um, a couple of years on peace processes in particular, was um, thinking of how peace processes actually look like, um, where are the discrepancies to how peace processes are perceived as they should look like. And quite often international engagement is still very much based on an ideal type of, of, of peace processes. And what the challenge is of, of the usual kind of power sharing approach that is taken in, in peace processes, where the challenges are and what could be done about this. I show you just one example where this led us to um, I'll share my screen, hope it works. I hope it does. Whoop. Can you see uh, the screen? So this is basically what we came up. So what we what we did in in this program was developing a database, um, the so-called the, the so PAX database. You find on a peaceagreements.org um, that encompasses basically all peace agreements that have been signed since 1990. We are basically pretty much complete when it comes to national and international processes. We are a bit lacking, obviously, when it comes to local peace processes because it's very difficult to get like a comprehensive sample. So we are, we are progressing on that. Um, but like the complete element of the national peace processes uh, gives us an idea about how processes look like. And see, we, we just crudely typologized peace agreements into kind of ceasefires, pre-negotiation agreements. So agreements that basically are memorandum of understanding and, and these kinds of elements kind of start a process. Then you get partial, pro partial agreements, finally comprehensive agreements and implementations. And in the ideal type of world, this would be like a, an upwards curve. Basically from the ceasefire, you go to the comprehensive to the implementation. But now when you see, and this is basically all the about 160 peace processes we see since 1990. And I just move over with the cursor. You can play around this with yourself if you're interested. And you see that not a single peace process globally has developed in the form as a chupe. It's just messy. And here is, I think, where the particular kind of expertise of our work is in. Because here, at the moment, you don't have like a fixed recipe. Um, you need like, you need like a feeling for conflict. You have like, you need also like to have a contextual understanding. You need to have like an idea of how, what you could kind of contribute beyond just working according to plan. Because basically the only thing that we really know about these processes, and this concerns mediation, whatever kind of processes around that, it's not working according to plan. That's, that's the only safe thing we are able to say from our research. And I mean, it is an, a bit like, and this, this, this is the, the accidents that then happened when I got asked some, some years ago by the, by the former director, basically, if I want to join SPR to um, bring this research um, closer to practice. It's, a, of course, a bit of a step if you're like on an academic career track, it's a bit of a side step. But it was then a very interesting chance to, because I enjoyed actually working with policy stakeholders quite a lot, kind of bringing this into, into practical considerations. I mean, we are, and the project is still running. So we just got another six years of funding from the British Foreign Ministry for what is now the Peace and Conflict Resolution Evidence Platform. So this will run um, probably until like almost 2030 now. It's kind of scary almost thinking that this will go so long. Um, but we would work with a lot of country teams and it's like country teams all over. So we work with Colombian, with the Colombian conflict, with Myanmar, lots of conflicts in the Middle East. And then of course, what then happened to become my area more um, in Sudan and South Sudan. 
And here then it is often that one thing comes to another because like I got then invited to be part of a kind of comprehensive survey process on the South Sudanese kind of conflict setting and, 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 and the South Sudanese peace process for the US State Department. And that led me to be kind of around in, in Juba for quite a while. So when then um, we had money left for actually involved, getting, getting ourselves involved in, in, in the Sudanese peace process after um, the ouster of the dictator Bashir and kind of the new opening that happened within the democratic transition, we were then looking around at kind of opportunities. Okay, what can we, could we actually do usefully with this money? And here then there is this rare chance where you can bring together a kind of more almost compared com comparative research. It's more like on the, on, the, on the academic level with a very practical engagement. Um, because I happen to be just in the middle of things that we got asked by the Sudanese if we want to engage with holdout groups in, 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 this, in this particular, this is called Juba peace process for Sudan. There's two holdout groups and we got then asked particularly to, ask, to, to work with one of them. But it was just not like my work on peace processes, but I was basically the only one basically from us able to move around in Juba, get money into Juba, so doing basically very practical things, which are also necessary. So kind of the... Um, um, let's say the job description for what we're doing is a bit like if an open open one and involves skills that are often kind of odd and really beyond what you would usually do because you need in a way also to getting to get things done. Um, and this is basically now one of the interesting most interesting openings I guess we have at the moment is trying we are now really engaged with one of the parties in in the Sudan, which is of course kind of challenging insofar as it is, considered to be the most difficult party, so to speak. Um, so a party hasn't signed any of these agreements before. It's never been kind of one of, the, one of the reliable partners, but it actually speaks to what I've seen, what I've showed before in terms of how messy and, 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 and open often these peace processes are. So you can't basically plan. And here I think what comes together is basically the, 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 the evidence that shows you need to have like a broader open process going. You can't just bet everything on one kind of process on one horse. Um, you need to be more open and more inclusive. And also having at the same time a rare opportunity to have like be kind of a trusted partner of one of the big players in such a process. You can't necessarily plan for this, but I think if you have done this chance, then that's really our role to, to, to become active in this regard and kind of set these things in motion. And I think this is this is basically what we try to what we try to do in our work. For the question. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you for making it quite obvious and quite clear to us that uh, peace processes are far away from linear developments. That you need a lot of intuition uh, in when you do your work on the ground. And well, um, it's, it's very interesting to also hear about your role in, in the complicated situation of Sudan. Well, um, I would like uh, to in a way tie in to the beginning of our presentation when Moritz Ehrmann uh, mentioned that there are hundreds or there were hundreds of delegations and persons coming to Schleining in order to be trained to move peace processes and mediation processes forward. So I first wonder, uh, would the situation and the history of Austria as a neutral country be positive and, um, and, and, and uh, stimulating for these processes? Do you think that uh, the situation of Schleining in Austria is, is relevant here? And uh, could you maybe specify um, the most successful initiatives that have taken place in Schleining? Uh, maybe you can um, elaborate a little bit on, on this area. Moritz. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, the, it, it is not a coincidence, of course, that such an institute uh, is placed in, in, in Austria. Sort of what we, what we see on the one hand is that uh, sort of when going abroad, when placing ourselves in a conflict area, um, Jan has this very direct experience from Sudan. I have this very direct experience from uh, uh, Iraq, uh, Yemen, and, and other contexts in the in the Middle East. Um, 
where, um, yes, the name of Austria um, opens doors. Uh, it sort of provides this um, cover of being somebody who, who doesn't mean, who at the very least doesn't mean uh, harm to you. Um, and at, at best is somebody perceived as, as, who, wants to, as who wants to help you. Um, and usually we sort of uh, uh, operate within within this range of uh, of, of perception uh, as an Austrian uh, person, as an Austrian uh, organization. Um, and likewise, of course, the perspective of uh, coming to to Austria um, to, uh, to to a sort of neutral, mostly far away uh, uh, place uh, to discuss. Uh, and uh, uh, try to get closer to, to solutions to in, in different conflict uh, uh, situations um, is a very attractive one still for, for, for many, many uh, sites that are involved in this. Um, the uh, uh, actors that uh, Jan was mentioning about Sudan, they have all been to, to Schleining in the, in the past. Uh, it's, it's been a long process sort of working uh, with them. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and, and of course, in extension, uh, uh, the castle uh, in the south, so very far away uh, from, from any major city, certainly far away from, from, from Vienna, um, provides an extra uh, motivation to many because it is uh, so remote, you're not seen, um, you can't be uh, distracted, um, and you can really uh, concentrate uh, on sort of uh, the issues that you bring uh, with yourself. Um, and uh, sort of uh, then what is very, uh, very interesting often to, to, to observe um, is that a sort of shining spirit uh, uh, develops in, in such situations where um, sort of uh, this creates a dynamic where so much more is possible than, than, than would have seemed at, uh, at first sight. And when the people then eventually go away, they carry away a sort of emotional uh, uh, link uh, to the place, a very positive emotional uh, link uh, to the place. Um, yeah, it's difficult to, to name sort of the most uh, successful one. I mean, uh, perhaps one that, that uh, I could mention because uh, it also carries the name of, uh, of Schleining. Um, is the so-called uh, Schleining process um, that unfortunately doesn't uh, uh, exist anymore, but used to be extremely successful uh, at the time, um, which um, was a process between uh, uh, high, highly placed uh, representatives, politicians, and, uh, and, and so on uh, from uh, uh, in the Georgian uh, conflict setting. So between uh, sort of uh, Tbilisi and, and Sukumi, Abkhazia and, uh, and, and sort of uh, 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 main Georgia. Um, this, uh, yeah, this was a highly successful process, both in terms of attendance, both in terms of what was discussed uh, and how uh, close they often came uh, in terms of uh, reaching actual solutions to uh, the problems that they were discussing. Of course, then bigger events uh, entered this conflict dynamic. As we all know, in 2008, uh, a big rupture occurred and, uh, uh, and this also meant the, the end of the Schleining process. Uh, but until then, it, it, was, it was certainly could be considered as one of the very successful uh, uh, peace initiatives that took place, generally speaking, and uh, ended our castle. Thank you very much, Moritz. This is certainly very inspiring. And I think we all would love to go to a retreat to your castle. Um, well, uh, as we all know, the COVID pandemic um, has struck us all over the globe in all areas. And I would imagine that the COVID pandemic has already had an effect on peace processes as well. Um, 
probably not a positive effect. Um, I could see from your homepage that you are doing research on the effect of the COVID pandemic on uh, peace processes. And I would like to ask you to elaborate a bit more about uh, this specific problem. Yeah, I'm glad to do so. It was basically also funding from the UK government where um, an initiative called COVID Collective was initiated to investigate in an even broader sense, the impact of COVID on, on the global south. And we did particular work on peace processes because like in the beginning, as, as you might recall, there was an initiative by the UN Secretary General who called for like a global ceasefire uh, in the face of the pandemic, which had a certain um, 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 kind of impact. So there was kind of, uh, in Colombia, there was a certain kind of acceptance of that. But like in more general terms, this initiative kind of fell apart almost because in the end, then it was not that that uh, the COVID pandemic led to, to a stop of the thing in the longer run. However, of course, um, it had, um, the pandemic had effects on peace processes quite considerably. Um, we did we did a comparative kind of quantitative study basically with, with an online questionnaire of experts on, on a variety of peace processes that are currently ongoing. And what you would see is basically a double effect um, that is on the one hand, a strengthening of the executive. Um, so basically in, in all the countries, basically the executive got strengthened in the first place. Um, in, in very factual terms, basically, you got like a stronger role in kind of fighting the pandemic, but also like had in the beginning often a popularity push in at least some of the countries. Uh, and the second element was then it led to considerable delays um, for the simple reason that negotiations would stop like in the first months. Also supervision of implementation would stop. Um, so you would see in uh, quite a few instances the, the immediate effect that Basically, the pandemic led to the executive using this to kind of pump products away and basically just delay, strategically delay processes. However, then in the longer run, and we repeated this, uh, this exercise then a, a bit later to see what the long-term effects of this are. Um, it hasn't really changed things. Um, so basically what, what was, um, and, and this is basically globally um, the case that the pandemic has kind of strengthened existing tendencies. So it's not really kind of changed elements, but like tendencies that have been there anyway, were kind of enforced through, through the effects. So basically the, in, in, in South Sudan, the process I, I know basically best, um, it, what happened was, was that there is a transition commission kind of supervising the, the whole process this transition commission wouldn't meet for like eight months because of the pandemic. Then they would start to meet online, um, but basically nobody would, would would supervise in the in the usual effect what happens in terms of training of unified forces, kind of the ceasefire arrangements, because there was also the problem that the UN mission that is in place couldn't go through the usual rotations. So people would stay. They have like a lots of 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 of, of impediments to their movements as well. So it became difficult to move move around into the country. Visas were very difficult to get for the whole year of 2020. So the international kind of supervision, international support got also severely weakened by that. I mean, now, um, basically what you have to say, and this concerns in a way the whole international support network, things are almost back to normal, which I think in a way is kind of a good thing. So the UN shifted in various countries, I know basically end 2020, early 2021 to the thing, okay, whatever we can do, we are now doing again. So we, the pandemic must not hinder us in, in, in doing the work that is necessary in terms of, of peace building. And um, however, there is something like I would see an, a, a huge time gap um, that is kind of developing because in a way, international organizations all shifted as we do here to Zoom meetings, Teams meetings, like all these online conferences, which led to a kind of very short session of ever more meetings. While at the same time, often conflict parties or like even governments in these 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 countries in these in these regions, 
they wouldn't go along with that. So they would keep their usual rhythm, would even delay and slow down the rhythm in face of the pandemic. So like there would be a huge discrepancy between a hyper meeting kind of context of internationals and actually completely different timing or like understanding of time and, and, and place even uh, within conflict parties. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Well, it comes as no surprise, I guess, uh, to all of us that the pandemic also has slowed down these processes, um, not in a beneficial way. So I think we all hope that um, also negotiating parties will be able to move around the globe to help um, to mediate and to meet personally, because it's always easier to talk to each other face to face, I guess. Um, one question um, would go to, I guess, Moritz Ehrmann, and it concerns the concept of uh, inside mediators, a concept you mentioned before in your presentation. I wonder uh, who would be the target group for you um, to choose um, inside mediators? Would you assume that uh, there is a difference of how women or men would act as mediators? Is there a sort of also maybe gender strategy in, in this selection? Could you elaborate a little bit more about the concept of inside mediators, please? Perhaps let me let me give you my sort of definition of what is an of what is an insider mediator, so that we have a sort of basis for what I'm going to say next. Um, so um, I would define as a, an insider mediator somebody who is part um, of a conflict uh, party, uh, so is considered one of the sides, um, but. Uh, at the same time enjoys trust that goes beyond his particular party so that reaches into the uh, if you want uh, opposite or enemy uh, camp that's what i what, what i would define as a as an inside mediator um and um of course um such um profiles uh could um, sort of be found on all levels and in all contexts. It's, it's, very, uh, it's very hard to, to define that uh, uh, the United Nations is currently uh, uh, conducting a, a study on, on inside uh, mediators and how to support them and, uh, and, and how the sort of their different uh, work uh, expresses themselves in different contexts. Mm. And uh, in the course of this, uh, uh, they did an interview with me on this, and uh, and I, I realized uh, myself how many uh, people we directly work with uh, that fall under this definition um, of of insider mediator. So people that are really sort of, practically speaking, project partners in in in, in our mediation uh, uh, projects. Um, so uh, uh, I mentioned sort of what we are, what we are, what we want to uh, do in the in the Libya project, um, uh, which is a sort of uh, normative approach. So we want to uh, uh, create insider mediators where they haven't where, uh, sort of where they haven't been there before. Um, but um, in some of our other projects, such as in uh, we have a project a mediation project in uh, Israel uh, Palestine. Um, where sort of the main concept uh, rests upon um, a group of insider mediators from, from both sides that are uh, certainly very much opposed in, in how they view the world, in how they view uh, the conflict, in what their interests are, um, yet they apparently inspire trust, nevertheless, um, uh, to the opposite side. And therefore, they're, they're able, as a group, uh, this is something, of course, that grew uh, over many, many years, um, they were able to, uh, or they are able now to do really extraordinary uh, things together. And they listened sort of uh, as, a, as a tandem or as a, as a, as a small group of, uh, of, of such insider mediators from, from the, the very opposite, uh, coming from the very opposite side. They are listened to um uh much much more 
um, then they are listened to when they are by themselves. So it's something it's something um, very uh, beneficial that has come out of this uh, of this dynamic. Um, and this is of course something that that you find in, in many contexts in less uh, clearer shapes. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's 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 an almost necessary element. Uh, you need such people. Uh, you need to work with such people who are sort of, uh, like I said earlier, who are part of the whole thing, but who are willing to step out of their comfort zone zone, and who are uh, willing sort of to 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 really strongly reach out to to the other side. Um, uh, because uh, we are, of course, always outsiders. And um, Jan has also hinted to this, we just function differently uh, in, in, in Austria, in the West, uh, than in most other places, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we need these people uh, with a very specific uh, perspective to, uh, to, to yeah, to provide this this perspective that we can that we can never have as an outsider. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I, I, I just would like to dig a little deeper. Could you maybe specify certain groups like political groups or religious or teachers or or you know other special professions maybe apt um, to to reach out to the other parties? Is it the older generation? Are these the younger ones coming out of business? Maybe you can give us a few concrete examples. Yeah, of course I could. Um, each example is of course very specific. Um, uh, let me think if I can find any terms of generalization. Um, so, I mean, it is usually um, sort of older generation people uh, who, sort of with their life experience uh, sort of invoke this uh, distrust that, that is necessary for uh, for such a for someone to be called uh, an inside mediator um, so i could give you an example for example from from iraq uh, from somebody who we uh, used to work with um, who used to uh, uh, fight uh, so he's shia um, but worked, uh, uh, not, not, not worked, fought uh, with uh, the Kurdish uh, resistance forces, the Peshmerga, uh, against uh, the regime of Saddam Hussein. Um, and uh, of course, after the fall of Saddam Hussein, remained very strongly in the, in the, in the Shia camp. Uh, so, so now the, the Iraq is, of course, uh, dominated by, by uh, sort of the, the Shia uh, uh, political class. Mm. Uh, and he is by profession uh, a, a university professor. So yeah, maybe this is a profession that one can say is is sort of very conducive for for such a position. Um, and uh, he has one of them. I'm not going to give you his name, but uh, but he has one of the most uh, sort of typical Shia uh, uh, names uh, uh, that you can imagine. And he has carried arms himself and uh, and uh, and then and then know some of his experience were really not experiences who, that were not really really not uh, very uh, pleasant uh, that he had to experience um nevertheless he today um is one of the personalities that you can uh, employ to all sides in the in the very complicated iraqi uh, setup so he can talk to the kurds he can talk to uh, uh, the, the Shia certainly, but also to the to the Sunnis uh, who he used to who he used to fight. Thank you very much. I'm certainly very glad to hear that university professors uh, can play an important role coming out of an academic institution here. Um, yeah, that's quite fascinating. Well, we have uh, three minutes left, more or less. So I would like to ask one last question to Jan and to Moritz. Um, who would be uh, your best international or regional partners? You mentioned the United Nations, and I think you also mentioned the OECE. Um, are the partners you are aiming at, maybe for the future? And uh, last but not least, uh, with one word, what would you expect 
um, to be the future work of Schleining, let's say uh, in the next decade, when you complete your first 50 years of existence? Perhaps I start and can more can then answer the difficult last question. It's more his job than mine, I guess. I think that the partners we're working with are, and, and this is, I think, a bit of a strength we have, is, is really broad. So it goes from basically regional Austrian funding to um, several international partners that are partly funding, but also like partly collaborating. Um, so certainly several of these, these, these partners are um, interesting to, to become closer and more important long-term, which is international organizations where I think we have a good collaboration going on with the OSCE. Could you specify? Uh, with the OSCE, so this would yeah. be one of those. Um, I think where we have more chance to collaborate, which we did partly individually. Um, so, so I did basically a peace and conflict analysis for the UN country team in, in South Sudan, but like the UN would be probably a partner um, um, longer term as well as regional organizations, EGOT, African Union. We work with um, in the ECOWAS region, but like a, a, a stronger collaboration with ECOWAS might be might be as well interesting for us. Um, I think what we what we have been successful in recent years is broadening our international funding base. So we have we have money basically from several European countries, um, from the UK, from the from the United States. So I guess the, the the bilateral funding base is, I think, growing, which is important. Not just as I've said before not just for, for having the money, but also like because it gives you credibility and also because this makes people listen to you and, and makes you in a way functional in, in the work we are doing. Yeah, one, one, one very specific actor that I would like to add is of course the European Union. That's uh, of course a very, very important partner that, uh, that we have and that we, uh, like Jan said, would would uh, also certainly uh, like to uh, deepen cooperation even even further with. Um, then, uh, of course, in terms, uh, yeah, where is our work uh, uh, expected to go? Um, well, um, we have a very broad portfolio as it is, of course, and this is something that we see very much as our comparative uh, strength that we are sort of able to to provide all these different accesses to, to the question of, uh, of dealing with conflict. Um, and that we're also increasingly trying to, to draw synergies between these uh, different approaches. Um, uh, this is sort of from a, from a substantial perspective. Um, from a more general perspective, um, what we see, of course, is that um, if you compare uh, to other sort of mm, small, neutral uh, or perceivedly neutral uh, European countries. Um, they all have institutes uh, uh, working in the, in the field of, uh, of um, larger field of peace building um, that play in the World League. Mm -hmm. Austria does not have such an institute and, uh, and, and also uh, the ASPR is not uh, at this level yet. Um, and this is, if you ask me, sort of what is, uh, what, what should be our sort of to this level as an uh, Austrian uh, organization that should have its place amongst these uh, these sort of, sort of highly re renovated international institutions in the field of peace building. Well, thank you very much for your um, presentation, for the visions uh, you presented uh, to all of us. Uh, in the name of the Diplomatische Akademie Wien, Vienna School of International Studies, I wish you and your team uh, all the best, lots of success and um, yeah, and a rise in, um, uh, to the level you wish to acquire. Thank you very much for your time. Good luck and maybe see you soon again at the DA.